So my wife bought this hanging clothes rack thing that you can lower down from the ceiling and hang the clothes on it and then pull on a rope and hang it back up. And it's really a pretty nice thing. It's got some nice black anodized pulleys with it and wooden rods for it. And it looks pretty good, except for this one little tacky thing, this cleat that has to hang on the wall at about eye level that you're going to see all the time. It's what people are going to look at. And this is just as plain and boring, 100% functional, but it bores me to death. My wife doesn't like it. So I'm going to make one out of forged iron today. And to do that, I am going to start with a piece of quarter by three quarter flat bar. It's five and a quarter inches long. Now this is one of those things that came out of just the scrap pile. It's a cut off left over from the chop saw or the shear or something like that. I didn't cut it for this. I don't know what I would use if I was making a whole batch of these. But for one off, using what's on hand so you don't have to cut fresh material up is always a good idea. And for those in metric, 6 by 20 by 130. Now for this project, I'm kind of inspired by the hook that I did the other day. I think it was last Sunday's hook. I'll link to that right up here if you haven't seen that video. It was a double hook and it had a forge weld in the middle. For this, I'm going to do a similar double end on it with the little knobs on the end. But I'm not going to fold it and forge weld it because it needs to have something on both ends to be a cleat. So at that point, I'll just bend those into the proper shape for a cleat. Should be a fairly simple, straightforward project. So the first thing I'm going to do, I think I'm going to come in an inch and a half from both ends. And that'll be the part that doesn't get forged. This will be the part that turns into the arms. It's going to be somewhat similar in length to this one, although not quite as long now, but by the time I draw these ends out, it should be bigger than this. I'm just going to center punch these so that I can find it again hot and know where I start drawing my arms out. Now don't forget to wear your safety glasses. I'm just going to start this with a little offset at the edge of the anvil. You can use a guillotine tool or fullering tool if you want to fuller that down, but this is good practice. I'm just going to leave about that much off the edge there, and that'll be our little knob in the long run. This is certainly easier if you use some other tool to create these shoulders. But this is good practice, and on a simple piece, if it's not perfect, that'll be okay. It'll be easy to correct with a file. If you ever watch Peter Ross work, he is the master at these offsets or blows like this on the edge of the anvil. He never misses. He's had lots of practice at it. I spent too much of my time using fullering jigs and guillotine tools. I'm going to go ahead and round that up. This will receive some kind of continuous refinement on all the parts as I work on the little ball in. I'm going to get that pretty close, then we'll turn it around and do the same with the other side. Now I've drawn this out far enough that I go ahead and work it here, which is much more solid. Certainly, if you're doing a lot of these, you can create a ball swedge, especially if you have a power hammer to use it under, but you could use one under a press or a treadle hammer. I'm just going to go ahead and put this in the vise and upset that down a little bit.
That should make it easier to work with. You could just almost leave it like that if you wanted to. So I can kind of work this down into a round shape. At this point, it's really all aesthetics. It's whatever shape you want this to be. You want it round or flat or heck, if you want it to go to a point and scroll it and put a little curly cue on it. If you're making a project like this, it's your project, not mine. Do what you want to do with it. These jaws I've got in the vise, the pieces of angle iron have rounded corners on them so I don't gouge the transition point on this. The vise is too sharp. This is just a big rivet header. And that's getting much closer to what I want. I have the bottom rivet setter that matches that. So I can kind of work around the side. You do want it fairly well centered on here, I think. Just going with very light, as evenly spaced hammer blows as I can do here. Just to give it some nice little facets. Kind of hide some of the cold shuts, which are inevitable when you're kind of doing a blob style ball like that. Start with a lot more material, you can get it cleaner and draw more of this out, but it'll be more work in the long run. So that's pretty much all I'm going to do there. We'll switch to a better pair of tongs for holding that. These are slotted jaw tongs, and we've done a video about these. I'll link to that up here in this corner. And these are the pause tongs, and I'll link to that video up here in this corner in just a few minutes. We'll do the same thing, line up our punch mark and start drawing this out. Of course, the second end always ends up looking better than the first end. Now these don't have to be a specific length, but they should match. So to find out if they match, I just use a pair of dividers. I don't need to worry about a, reading a measurement on a ruler. And that's just a hair longer, I think. Yep, so I'm going to draw this end out just a little bit more. And while I'm here, I'm going to straighten out this bent leg, or bent arm. I don't know if it's an arm or a leg. This bent protrusion, just by working on rounding this up, I can get this to draw out that little bit. Only needs about an eighth of an inch, and that's probably not enough to be that important. But if I can make it look right, I will. That's a lot better. So I'm going to let this cool, and then I'm going to file these transition points and get them smooth and even, and knock any sharp spots off the ball. I'm not worried about making the balls perfect. I kind of like that organic effect myself, and one of the reasons I prefer to not use a die for the final shape. 
Although if I were making these as a batch item for sale, I probably would make a die for them because it would probably save me about a half hour per hook, and that's a lot of time, which equals a lot of money. This shouldn't take a lot of filing. I just want to use a half round file to clean up this transition point here. And I'm going to bevel it a little bit to the front while I'm doing this, just because the bevel looks a little bit nicer in my opinion. You can forge the bevel in, but since I'm here with a file, and then check the balls for any sharp spots. With the profile the way you want it, now is a good time to go ahead and punch holes in it. And you can certainly drill holes, there's no reason you have to punch them, but we might as well. It's a good way to improve your comfort on some of these techniques. up with the slug stuck in the bolster there. That's all you punch out. And we can do the same thing on the other end. Try to get them spaced evenly. You can certainly lay this out and center punch it, but there again learning to do it by eye is a good skill. And if they're a little off most people aren't going to worry about it too much. Slug stuck in the bolster plate again. I'll go ahead and put my touch mark in the middle. I think I'll just put the bare paw. This is kind of small for both parts of the touch mark. I'll just put that right between the two screw holes. And the last step then is to bend the, the hook ends. I guess this could have been a hook of the week almost, because it is a form of a hook. And make sure everything is straight. And do the other end. You could just as easily have bent one of these up into a regular hook to make a coat hook out of, and we've looked at coat hooks very much like this before. Right, it's pretty darn close, I think. I do want these to kick out a little bit, it's easier to get the the rope on them if they're not too tight to the wall. That yeah, looks pretty good. These arms did end up slightly different lengths in spite of trying to make sure they weren't. And of course my last step, I'm going to just put a little bit of paste wax on this. This is Min Wax. I frequently use Johnson's Paste Wax. Just depends what you want to put on there. Wipe off any excess paste wax, but now it's time to go hang this up and get that project installed. But then by all means, make time in your day to get out to your shop, make something, stay safe, wear your safety glasses.
We'll see you for the next one.